Hello, everyone. Welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a series of digital interviews that we launched during this work from home period uh, that provide conversations with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And what we're really trying to do during these SALT Talks is replicate the experience that we provide at our SALT conference series and what we're doing there is really providing a window into the minds of subject matter experts and providing a platform for what we think are interesting and uh, world-changing ideas. And today, we're very excited to welcome Paniotis Lombropoulos to Salt Talks. Uh, Paniotis is the portfolio manager for hedge funds at the Employees Retirement System of Texas, which is a $26 billion retirement plan located in Austin, Texas, the capital. His responsibilities include sourcing, analyzing, and evaluating potential hedge fund managers, process and performance assessment, interviewing various fund employees and third-party service providers, and maintain, maintaining the due diligence efforts. A Paniotis started in the alternative investment industry, industry as a research analyst at Grosvenor Capital Management in Chicago. He later joined MCP Alternative Asset Management, a $6 billion Tokyo headquartered fund of funds. And while he was working for that fund, he was actually still based in Chicago. Uh, Paniotis holds a BS in business administration with a concentration in finance and marketing from Boston College and an MBA in general management from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. So as you can see, despite now living in Austin, Texas, he's very steeped in Chicago culture. Uh, Paniotis has earned his chartered alternative investment analyst designation, the KIA, uh, financial risk manager uh, des designation, as well as the chartered financial analyst designation, the CFA. And just a reminder for our audience during today's talk, if you have a question for Paniotis, you can enter it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your video screen. And hosting today's interview is Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. And Anthony is also the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. John, thank you. And I'm sure Paniotis, you love the way he pronounces your name. He's been working on that for the last month. So Congratulations to you, Darcy. That was well done. Thank but you. I want to I want to go to your personal background. Like, how did you? Uh, we all have our different odysseys, uh, to use a Greek expression. How did you get to Texas ERS? What 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 got you thinking that that was the direction you wanted to take the career in? Uh, uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and being part of uh, this talk series and. Uh, given the, the pandemic and the times that we live in, I hope everybody's well on your side. Uh, yeah, my, my arrival here uh, is, is part uh, life, part luck, uh, part choices, uh, as is anything else with life. Uh, my personal background actually starts, you know, if you want to start at the beginning of the Odyssey, starts in Greece. I was born and raised in Greece. I was there till I was uh, 13 years old. In, in Athens? Which in, in Athens. Athens. In Athens. Okay. I was in Athens. A beautiful so, city. Yeah, uh, five minutes outside of downtown. Um, and uh, life uh, kind of came at me unexpectedly. I lost my father when I was 13 years old. And family decision was to move to America. My mother's family was in Massachusetts. Hence my connection to Massachusetts and Boston College. Uh, but I've always wanted to be in finance and investments. And so wh interest, where, where did you move to, if you don't mind me asking? Where, uh, Central Massachusetts, uh, just north of Worcester, Mass. Okay, so sure. 60 miles west of uh, Boston. Yep. Uh, finished high school there, uh, as John alluded to. I, I did my undergrad at Boston College. Uh, did a couple years of accounting. Wasn't really my long-term interest. Uh, investments always uh, was my, my real interest and passion. And that interest actually was born from uh, my grandmother, uh, who turned 100 last year. And uh, wow. congratulations still with us. Uh, and she obviously, depend, as you can guess, based on her age, she has seen a few things in her life. Uh, and the first thing she taught me was the, uh, the power of compounding and saving. Uh, and when I arrived in the States, it was the advent period of mutual funds and the markets were changing. So that's where my, my curiosity for investments uh, really began. And through a friend, I uh, ended up in Chicago. Uh, Grover Capital Management was, was my foray into the alternative investment world uh, back in 2000. And that's where I got my start uh, in, in this nuance and new vehicle called hedge funds. I had no idea what it was, but it sounded interesting and different. And to date myself, uh, prior to my first interview, I ran down to a Borders, uh, picked up whatever few books were available back then about hedge funds, 
just to prep myself a little bit uh, for the interview. Uh, luckily, they believed that uh, the lights were on and somebody was home upstairs and I could pick up stuff quickly. Uh, and from there, uh, as they say, the rest is somewhat history. Uh, stayed in Chicago for 15 years. Uh, the big change in, from my time in Chicago was uh, the financial crisis um, uh, and the tsunami in Japan actually affected my life. MCP's business model uh, is that they cater only to Japanese financial institutions. Uh, and in combination with the financial crisis and exposure to the tsunami that happened in Japan, there was a retrenchment in the company, there was a retrenchment in the industry. Uh, but I wanted to stay in the industry. I love this industry. I'm, I'm very passionate about it. And I ran across uh, this growth here in Austin and the growth in the public sector. And my, my idea was that I could take my experience, hit the ground running, contribute to small teams right away, at the same time continue to, to learn and build on my investment acumen and my personal growth. And that's what kind of brought me here to Austin uh, as they were building a new program. Your, your foray in hedge funds, let me, because I'm faced with this dilemma every single uh, day. Why hedge funds? Uh, active management, <laughs> passive management, yay. Why hedge funds, Pandy Otis? What, 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 uh, what the value the, proposition make, make, the, make the case for me. And then obviously, John, as he's making the case, please record it two times. And so this way we can give it to our sales force. Go ahead, make the case. Well, in terms of, of hedge funds themselves, the, the overall how we view hedge funds here at ERS, well, we believe that they can be utilized to protect and pervert, to preserve investment capital, provide risk diversification, uh, and provide that downside protection that everybody talks about. Downside protection that uh, became valuable this past February and, and March. And hedge funds overall, we think of as businesses, as investment conduits, not as strategies. And so we're talking about individuals that are able to take advantage of massive dislocations and the accompanied volatility and uncertainty that comes up with those massive uh, dislocations. The other thing I would say about hedge funds is that, and, and they don't, I think, get enough do about this, is they're always uh, in the forefront of innovation and flexibility. Markets change, investments, opportunities change, uh, and hedge funds have offered that opportunity to generate a different source of returns by having that flexibility and innovation on, on their side. At the end of the day, what you, uh, we really focus on uh, is really simple, is a clear purpose and expectation of what hedge funds are intended to do within our portfolio. That sense of the foundation of whether or not we are successful or not, how we measure success. If you enter into a hedge fund saying, well, I just want high returns or I want a hedge fund that always beats the S&P, more often than not, investors will be disappointed. Uh, first of all, the word hedge is in hedge funds. Unless you're 100% net long, you're not going to keep up with those returns. So for us, we set a purpose and expectation of what is it we want this tool in our overall toolbox to do for us and do we succeed? So for example, in our absolute return portfolio, uh, one measure of success is whether or not it truly provides diversification to the rest of the trust. And we have quantified that success by targeting a beta of 0.4 or less for our portfolio to the rest of the trust. Inception to date, which is almost eight years now, we have succeeded. Why? Because our beta is less than 0.4. Are we targeting returns? Yes, just like everybody else. And we have met those returns. But the primary purpose has been met. And that's how we measure success. And anecdotally, that success was met in, in March. Uh, so that's one way uh, to, to measure success. What is uh, the success? What is the purpose uh, of what is it that you want to do? Uh, in terms of active versus passive, uh, obviously, the last 10 years have been unusual. And since the great financial crisis, uh, I, I think that you have to figure out what is it that's been present and, and has worked or not for active versus passive managers. So, for example, uh, since the financial crisis, we have definitely seen um, managers being challenged by the fact that we've had a higher concentration of opportunities and, and, and less number of opportunities, higher capital changing the same number of opportunities. At first glance, you may say that the recent rebound in the S&P for the March lows 
uh, is probably the same issue. Uh, we are driven by five or six stocks, at most two sectors. Uh, and anecdotally, we can see other data that uh, lead us to believe that, that this is a very thinly traded breadth type of recovery. But there's a lot going on below the surface. The five or six stocks are kind of the tip of the iceberg. If you look below the surface and under the water, uh, for example, we see that uh, almost a fifth uh, of the S&P companies are now trading below, more than 50% below their all-time highs. Uh, the average stock in the S&P index is about 30% below its peak. Three out of the 11 sectors in the S&P are in the green, the rest are in red. And as I mentioned, about five of the largest stocks that are driving this recovery account for a quarter of the rally since the March lows. And those five stocks, are in, in aggregate, uh, have a close to a $7 trillion market cap, which is larger than the Japanese topics index. So there's a lot of diversification and dispersion going below the surface, which should benefit active management and active hedge funds. Uh, we saw a high pairwise correlation uh, since the fi financial crisis. That seems to be re re uh, reverting itself. Again, a lot going on below the surface if you're just looking at equities. The same story could probably be said about the credit market uh, as well. Um, so overall, and, and the last thing I'll probably mention is momentum. Uh, we've seen growth factor outperform value for the better part of the last 10 years. Now we've seen a reversal. And whether you believe we're coming out of the current recession or eventually we're gonna grow out of it for perhaps following a double dip recession, value factor, which tends to be a contrarian play, should outperform growth. So there's a lot going on here in terms of dispersion and volatility and uncertainty that should benefit hedge fund strategies. You know, so I, I you know, listen, that's music to my ears and I totally agree with you, particularly with the concentration level. So, uh, so we, we, we've both been doing this a long time. Uh, what do you think happens to those five stocks, even if the fundamentals and something that's trading at 170 times earnings are strong, isn't it possible that you could see multiple compression and have a stock trade to 80 times earnings and still be growing at 15 to 30 percent, but lose half your money? Oh, sure. If I, if I before I address that question, uh, to tie the knob up, the active versus passive argument, I, I, I'll find beta because that's what at the end of the day what we're really talking about. In my opinion, are often spoken or too often spoken in absolute terms. Uh, it's either one or the other. First, I think there's room for both, and you can uh, allocate to both types of factors. But more importantly, I think I think of alpha and beta as bookends. I don't think of them as absolute terms. And what I mean is that if you have beta on one end and alpha on the other, you have a spectrum of other strategies that could benefit. It's not easy to quantify alpha at many points. So given where we are right now in the cycle, for example, we might anticipate that distressed investing should do well a year, two, or three years from now. Distressed investing, I think, is a form of alpha. You need a, a good team to source, a good team to work out these opportunities. It's not easy uh, to generate that alpha, but it is a form of alpha uh, that should be accounted for in your portfolio. So that's another argument for active and alpha uh, generation. Well, it, 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 it's well said. And so, so but, and we know, stick at the passive for the second, we know that that trade is very, very crowded. It's the S&P 5. Mm -hmm. And as you're pointing out, it's the S&P 495. Yep. And so what do you think happens there? So I think at the moment, uh, in, in, in conjunction with that, there's a lot of conversation about valuations and and it, there is definitely a bifurcation uh, between the financial market and economic reality, whether it's the stock market and the real economy, there's definitely a bifurcation uh, between the two. And right now, what I would probably do is separate first and foremost, the market between technicals uh, and, and fundamentals. And at the, at the time, I think at the moment, uh, technicals are definitely outweighing fundamentals and serving as heavy tailwinds for the current market. And part of the technicals I would allude to or, or, or point out to are, first of all, M2, money supply provided uh, by the Fed. Sure. If you overlay the current Fred M2 uh, St. Louis uh, Central Bank graph with the S&P, it's a one-for-one -one relationship. Uh, the other favorite acronym, TINA, 
there's no alternative. We have low rates and investors need yield, they need returns. By default, they're, they're looking to more return-seeking assets like stocks. Sure. Uh, we have FOMO. Uh, right now, we have at the lowest percentage of shares outstanding being short uh, in the last 20 years. Even the most bearish or, or skeptical investors have to turn bullish so they're not being overrun sure. in their short book. Um, and so the technicals, I think, are definitely overwhelming. On the fundamental side, price seems to definitely have run up and ahead of earnings. The question is, at this moment in time, how much has been priced in, looking ahead, and what type of key assumptions are any, anybody on a fundamental uh, case is making about COVID, about earnings growth, about unemployment rates, uh, about GDP growth. It seems like a perfect storm of normalizations has to come in play in order for everything to work out and justify the current uh, fundamentals and valuations. Um, what I would say though is two things. One, the valuation that we're alluded to, again, is concentrated to one part of the market. There's close to $5 trillion of cash Amazing. sitting on the side. We could see a rotation once we get more validity of some type of recovery and stability in the market. So that cash could find its way in other parts of the market. Again, perhaps cheaper parts of the market. Sure. Sectors that haven't participated in this recovery or rally. The other thing I would make is, although we are making an argument that the market is perhaps frothy or expensive, we have been in a new regime of rates in the last 10 years, and we're most likely going to remain in the same regime for the next 10 years, unless we have unexpected or unforeseen spike in inflation. So if we're looking at a valuation matrix of any choice compared to a historical mean, I could argue that given the new regime and lower discount rates, that mean eventually will have to come up. And so whatever absolute valuation you're looking at, to the new mean that should come up, the market is probably not as expensive as you may think. If right. participants think that the market is 15, 20% overvalued based on a valuation matrix, I could argue it's probably far less, maybe five to 10 range. And so it may be not be as extreme as you think. It, 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 it all makes sense. Let, before John is chomping at the bit here to ask questions, we're getting a lot of audience participation. Uh, and so I'm gonna turn it over to John in a second. Everything you're saying, makes great sense. Uh, but I want to go to an area of the market that was an epicenter of the March sell-off, which was the structured credit area of the market, which has seen a little bit of a recovery. Uh, do you have an opinion on structured credit one way or the other? Uh, I, I, we have an internal team that, that focuses on, uh, on structured credit, internal credit. Uh, we were quick to put some capital to work. As you alluded to, we saw the big sell-off uh, in, in March. Uh, within structured trade, we haven't seen a rebound, but it has only been a rebound uh, in the AAA, AA. We, the lower credit rating hasn't recovered as fast, uh, so there might be still opportunity there. The problem has been uh, the Fed. Uh, the Fed has acted as a backstop uh, to uh, a lot of the credit migration that we thought we were going to see, and the C buckets were most likely going to uh, violate a lot of their interest coverage or OC coverage. And that's what we were expecting. But for the time being, the Fed has acted as a backstop. The Fed, only, the only thing the Fed had to do was announce its intention of getting involved in the market, and we saw a rebound. It right. hasn't even put to use all of the capital that it announced uh, for various programs. And so uh, I think it still needs to, to play out. Uh, we're keeping an eye on it, uh, but we haven't, other than the early uh, buying opportunity that we saw in March, we haven't put yet additional capital to work. We've seen some rebound, uh, but we're in the wait and see mode. And, and why do you think the Fed hasn't really, fo they, they obviously focused and at least directed attention to high yield and they did direct some attention to investment grade, but why do you think they've laid off of most of structured credit except for the new issue market that's uh, AAA rated? Uh, it's hard to say. I think overall the Fed's intention was to stabilize the market, provide liquidity, uh, provide the, take advantage of the lessons learned from 08 uh, and, and make sure we didn't have uh, a liquidity problem that turned into a solvency problem. Sure. And so I think they wanted to bookend the market to provide some comfort that at least the market would function. 
uh, companies would have access to capital. And at the very least, again, not that I completely agree, provide that technical backstop or at least uh, for investors not to start puking out uh, paper simply because they had to keep up with indices or they were violating uh, any credit rating uh, allocations that they had in the portfolio. Uh, and so in a way, you know, we, we migrated from uh, you're too big to fail to nobody's allowed to fail. Uh, that's, I think, the big difference that we've seen in, in the last 10 years. Yeah, yeah it, it makes sense. We're, boy, we're, we're in very different territory than the market that you and I grew up in, uh, where the Fed had a light touch and they did some monetary policy lightly and they did some currency intervention. Uh, but now we seem to have a very big macro trader in the market known as the Federal Reserve and frankly, the global central banking system. Uh, but uh, uh, John, I know wants to ask some questions. So please interject, John. I know you've got some Anthony, audience just because, participation. Just here. because Paniotis has a very distinguished beard during the, uh, the work from home period <laughs> doesn't mean he's as old as you. He just doesn't use the same type of hair dye. <laughs> Anyway, well, I can, well, first of all, it's not quite hair dye, it's shoe polish. And I can send you a case of it anytime you want. <laughs> and um, and I, would re- I, w- I would recommend when you get to BRA, you don't want to have a lot of snow on the roof. Okay. <laughs> and right now you're looking like you got a lot of snow in the basement there. So I, I, that's, we, we, that's can talk when the, we can talk when this is over. See, he always comes in and tries to give me a karate chop to the Adam's apple. You see that? I have to keep him honest. So we, we talked about structured credit, uh, structured credit, Paniotis, but I want to talk about more broadly the hedge fund space. Obviously, there's a lot of technical dislocations in March uh, in response to the pandemic and the economic fallout from the pandemic. What asset classes to you became most attractive during that period? What asset classes within the hedge fund space still look attractive? And what are others that you think will be more challenging in the near term as we try to rebound from all the effects of the pandemic? So uh, really quickly uh, on, the, on the liquid space, uh, one area that we uh, might begin looking at and it may sound a bit contrarian might be the equity long short space. Uh, the one argument uh, is that the one I just made in terms of uh, increased dispersion uh, despite uh, the massive run up in the markets. Uh, the other argument is that whether you believe that we're headed into a double dip recession or that we might eventually be uh, part of the next economic cycle, either way, again, we'll either see dispersion or we may see a rotation in the market. We may see value overtaking growth. There should be a lot of activity within the equity long short space. Yeah, the, the, latest, uh, uh, the latest letter that they're describing the recovery with is a K-shaped recovery. So that sort of fits with your theme of dispersions of there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. You just have to find talented managers that are able to, to pick those out. Correct. And obviously, the, the big challenge, again, on that side would be the short side. Uh, but we believe eventually that we might be able to find those managers that have that uh, long history, sustainable history, and persistent history. Uh, the other, uh, given uh, the anticipated choppiness of the market, uh, I know it's been a, a monodirectional uh, ascension since the March lows, but we do anticipate choppiness uh, and increased volatility. Uh, we start. See, I think we're seeing signs of it now. Uh, we have seen the massive V-shaped bounce, albeit off, off extreme lows. So you would expect that, but we're starting to see a sideways movement in the market as unemployment benefits are uh, now on, on the wayside. As more uncertainty continues with whether or not uh, there will be more hotspots, how long it's going to take for some type of medical solution to COVID. Uh, again, that will it should increase uncertainty and volatility. So relative value strategies and global macro strategies should benefit uh, from that type of environment, especially a discretionary global macro. But again, the Fed is the big elephant in the room and a discretionary global macro has been fighting that uh, headwind for 10 years. And that will be again, the big challenge. On the less liquid side, we have an opportunistic credit uh, portfolio and we are taking a look there within uh, longer term, we're gonna look at distress. But we're also looking at some niche opportunities uh, like bank uh, uh, risk sharing and bank reg- regulatory capital sharing. Uh, compared to 08, financials are not the epicenter uh, of the problems that we have today. Uh, conversely, banks will be expected uh, to be liquidity providers and help in the, in the economic uh, recovery. The uh, market itself, the bank, uh, the BRS market has grown. Uh, the latest uh, 2019 figures show that it's up to 100 billion or so. 
Uh, and so we believe that that would be an interesting strategy. It's a strategy that we've had some exposure to. We're looking to perhaps increase that exposure uh, in terms of a strategy. Um, and we are looking potentially at distress uh, uh, down the road. Uh, in the immediate future, the one area that I believe might offer an interesting opportunity is direct lending, uh, but not in a good way. Uh, following the financial crisis, we saw partly because of the local rule, uh, partly because of the economy, a new market being created, a new vacuum coming in to provide that credit, which was direct lending. And we've seen an unprecedented growth uh, in the last 10 years for that market. The problem is it's a market that hadn't been really tested. Uh, and one thing that we saw is obviously a lot of money being put to work, raised and put to work right away. And I think this type of a market environment is going to show uh, the true underwriting skills, the true ability for teams that should be in the direct lending market, those that shouldn't have been in the direct lending market. And one area of concern is that we're not, we're not seeing in docs right now. And one area that a lot of our managers have pointed out is the lack of maintenance uh, coverage uh, within the underwriting standards. And so it's a bit of a repeat or rhyme, if you will, uh, with the subprime trade of 06, 07. It may be take a different tor- uh, turn this time around, but we may have a secondary distress direct, direct lending market to take a look at. And I thought that would always be uh, something interesting to look at. If you wait long enough, everything becomes an opportunity, right? Um, so you spent almost your entire career in the hedge fund space evaluating other managers in a multi-manager type of format. When you're evaluating potential investments in hedge funds or, or other alternative funds, what type of organizational characteristics do you look for and personal characteristics do you look for in the investment team? Yeah, first and foremost, it starts whether it's our absolute return program or emerging manager program that we uh, revamped a couple of years ago. It starts with the philosophy that we're looking at businesses and not funds. Uh, it, you, know, you always kind of want to think of it that way, whether they're managing a portfolio or building a widget, it doesn't matter. You, you think of it as a business first. Given who we are, who we serve, the amount of capital we're putting to work, we need to partner with institutional caliber type firms. Uh, obviously, from an investment or operational due diligence point of view, we, we look at qualitative and quantitative factors just like everybody else. On the quantitative side, we'll look at uh, various sources of return, key periods of performance, both good or bad. Uh, it's not simply about the quantity of returns, but we want to assess the quality of returns as well. And we overlay that performance with key investment or risk management decisions and opportunity sets. On the quality per, uh, side, obviously, we want to look at the quality of experience, team members, uh, honesty. Uh, that's obviously much more important post Madoff. Uh, we want to get an inside look uh, in a roadmap of the thought and the process. It's not always about the answers you get, about how, but it's also about how somebody gets to those answers. And that's something I really pay attention to. And obviously, culture and opportunity. Uh, the, the goal of our process is to try and tie performance or statistics back to the stated strategy, the risk constraints, and the opportunity set. At the end of the day, are they doing what they said they were going to say they were going to do. Uh, at a high level, that translates to probably two words that come to mind, uh, consistency and adaptability or flexibility. Uh, we want to see consistency in the thought process, the investment decision-making process, risk management, and the team itself. Uh, we want to examine the throughput, not just the output. And in terms of flexibility, I'm not talking about strategy drift. Uh, but somebody that's able to adapt to new market conditions, opportunities, new tools that become available uh, to them. Um, at the below level, at the PM or team level, some characteristics that I think make investment hedge fund managers or investors uh, are rather simple. Uh, the desire to succeed or, or build something that matters to them and their team or legacy. The ability to communicate both internally and externally to key stakeholders uh, the drive to be better and do better every day, driven by strong analytical skills. High emotional IQ. Uh, you need to have no fear in making decisions, uh, making investment decisions, taking those risks. The ability to listen and put together a lot of information from various sources and, and come together with, with some type of outlook. And the self-awareness uh, to, to be aware of your strengths and exploit those strengths but also mitigate your weaknesses or work on your blind spots. Um, At the end of the day, 
what is due diligence? We want to make sure that the foundations that made a successful hedge fund in the past are present today to give us and them the ability or higher probability than not to be successful in the future. Yeah, I think, you know, at Skybridge, that's something that we certainly concentrate on as well. I think in the post 2008, nine period, there were a lot of uh, investment managers to use a Greek word that were apostheosized, where, you know, people assigned genius to them because of bets they made as a result of the crisis, but haven't necessarily performed in the 11 years after that. It's very important to uh, continue to drill down on consistency of process and adaptability to different market conditions, like you mentioned. Um, in your emerging manager, emerging manager program, like you mentioned, why is it important to you guys to have an emerging manager program? What do you look for in emerging managers? And what advice would you give to managers that are starting out that are looking to distinguish themselves and bring that institutional quality process uh, you know, to their investment team? Sure. So the thesis uh, for, for to start or revamp our investment, uh, our manager manager program was actually twofold. One, uh, as Anthony alluded to, we've been doing this for a while. We've seen a lot of names come and go. We know who the names are. But I thought that we were reaching an inflection point of what I call a generational gap. Uh, we start seeing a, a lot of the, the successful managers of yesterday either shutting down, retiring, turning their businesses into family offices. And so there had to be a transition, a passing of the baton, if you will, uh, of that next generation. I thought it was becoming increasing in terms uh, of its frequency. So we wanted to take advantage of the fact that we wanted to find uh, the future manager that was gonna be successful earlier and today. The second th part of this thesis was that, and this was pre-pandemic, capital raising environment was extremely challenging. And so if we were in a position to provide that capital and, and be that liquidity provider, we could come from a position of strength and leverage in terms of uh, what type of terms and conditions uh, we could ask for, what type of inside look we could get from the manager themselves. Third, given the amount of capital we were gonna put to work, we thought that if we could establish a relationship very early uh, on and we could get an inside look of what their strengths and weaknesses are, we can then down the road perhaps form or put together some type of solution-based product that builds upon that strength to either take uh, advantage of that to solve a problem for us, the trust, or offer the, ma the market in general. So that was kind of the general thesis about three or four years ago when we kind of started this process. And we announced the partnership with Panco Prisma in June of 18. Uh, we also wanted to offer the market a unique structure uh, that was a little bit different from other seeders. We believe we have achieved that uh, in the form of the fact that ERS is willing to invest in the commingle structure uh, in order to build a new or upon an existing track record. By agreement and, and by its definition of the business model, Panco Prisma will invest uh, side by side for ERS, will match minimum dollar for dollar what we're willing to put it to work, and they will do so through the SMA. We get the transparency of that account because Panco shares that transparency with we negotiate uh, our own terms and conditions, but we also offer and ask for operational and financially focused uh, parachutes, if you will, uh, to protect ourselves, which collapse to those of PAMCO. So in a way, we've for ERS, we've created, if you will, a synthetic SMA without having to open SMA. We get the benefits of SMA without having to open an SMA. So that was the idea. That was the execution. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is create a farm system for ERS. We're looking at each individual strategy on a standalone basis. We're looking at each manager on a standalone basis. And the, the idea and the hope is that if this manager is successful, we will put them either in our absolute return portfolio or find a home from them somewhere else within the trust, as long as they're bringing subtype of skill set, subtype of exposure that we can't replicate in house, and that will be their value proposition to the trust. That's fascinating. Again, it has some echoes to uh, the way we try to build a farm system at Skybridge as well, because uh, you never know when you're going to need to call on certain strategies or or uh, funds with certain profiles to exploit an opportunity set that presents itself in, in the case of a surprise pandemic. John, let me let me interrupt for a second, because I'm yep. very curious to how these guys think about the, the pandemic and the impact that it's having on their investment strategy and the long-term 
prospects for the U.S. economy. What are your thoughts there with your economic team? In terms of the pandemic? Yeah. I, we, we don't have uh, necessarily uh, economists in-house. Uh, obviously, each team has its own view. Uh, we talk, obviously, to a lot of managers uh, in, in the sales side streets to gauge what the general consensus is. Uh, obviously, there's still a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I think the markets, uh, by the hour, by the day, sway between hope that a, a new vaccine is on the horizon or a new vaccine was announced in terms of what stage it's in or a new technique uh, to deal with a lot of the symptoms. And then we'll retrace back to some type of uncertain despair if, if that hope turns to be untrue or uh, misguided or misrepresented. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the big unknown is when some type of medical safety net is gonna be provided. That's what we're all waiting for. Uh, and assuming we get there, whether it's six, 12, 18 months from now, I think the bigger question is, well, what paradigm shift have we all witnessed at once and which paradigm shift becomes temporary and which becomes permanent? And the big question is the consumer. Uh, you know, how, how will they change their behavior? How will their spending change? Is it going to normalize? Is it going to take some time to turn back, go back to normal? Uh, airlines you know, could open all they want, but if you and I don't feel safe on getting a plane, it, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Um, and so that's how we're, we're taking it very cautiously that there is a lot of noise, the signal uh, noise ratio is high, and we're taking it very slowly. We're trying to adjust our due diligence process just like everybody else in thinking about the long term. But the economic uncertainty is still there. But at the end of the day, we are long-term investors. That's why we have an, a, an IPS in place. We're sticking to it. We're not trying to panic. And we're taking it week by week, month to month, as the new information becomes available. But as long as you stick to the IPS, I think you should be fine. That's and, good, absolutely great advice. And in terms of uh, the pandemic, before we let you go, just how you haven't lived through quite as many financial crises as Anthony, but how do you think the aftermath of this crisis plays out over the next five to 10 years in the hedge fund industry? You commented on that a little bit earlier in the context of your response uh, regarding active and passive management. But if we look out five to 10 years, what do you think the landscape is in terms of uh, the hedge fund industry in the wake of this well, pandemic? Before you answer that, I, you know, come on, that was an ageist shot at me uh, from a <laughs> millennial. Okay. So the so, so two and you are going to take me in basketball when this is over. Okay. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Boss, which right. is, um, <laughs> um, that's <laughs> oh my God. All right. Go ahead. Answer the question. Um, if I had to kind of vision about the industry, I think, um, first of all, I think AUM, uh, we're at roughly three trillion, uh, and that's been stalling and it has plateaued in the last couple of years. I think assets under manager, I think actually going to increase. Uh, I think that alternatives and hedge funds are going to be able to offer a different source and a different type of return. Again, in what most likely will be a low yielding environment and a lot of liability-driven or liability-based portfolios are gonna to struggle to meet those targeted returns that are still somewhere in the area of six and a half, seven percent unless you either concentrate your portfolio or you lever up. The math is very simple. Uh, and so I think alternatives will, uh, again, prove their value and assets will increase. I think the uh, number of hedge funds that are gonna be out there will shrink uh, as I think they should. I don't think they're truly eight, nine, 10,000 hedge funds out there. I think if we uh, were to take an honest look of what makes a hedge fund, we're probably in the area of a thousand. And if we really filter in terms of quality, we're probably far less than that. And so I think the number of hedge funds will probably decrease as it should. And we might see actually more consolidation in the industry of hedge funds and firms coming down uh, within under a greater umbrella uh, for greater economies of scale, a greater opportunity to offer a variety of solution-based products. I think technology is gonna play a bigger role uh, in the hedge fund industry. Uh, technology has pulled forward a number of theses that uh, we thought we might play on the five, next five, 10 years and fast forward them uh, to today. Uh, perfect example, look at how we communicate between the three of us uh, today with such ease. Um, but I think technology will become a bigger part of hedge funds. And I'm not talking about AI and machine learning. I'm talking about a greater efficiency in use and risk management, greater use in terms of operational efficiency, 
uh, back office to front office. I think technology will become a bigger part and should be embraced. I will be used greater uh, in due diligence. Uh, I can see more data rooms being opened, a lot of virtual visits becoming the norm and part of uh, the due diligence process. I've called it the humanizing of due diligence. Uh, I can see us binge watching a bunch of IDD videos as opposed to binge watching Netflix. And we just hear what the manager is doing and saying as opposed to reading your typical AMA DDQ. Uh, and in terms of the strategies, I think ESG, impact investing is here to stay. And I think it will be a bigger part of not just the general market, uh, but I think portfolio investing and uh, uh, portfolio consideration. And lastly, uh, I think because uh, alternatives are already a bigger part of portfolio construction, I think the modernization of risk of portfolio construction will probably improve. And what I mean by that, for example, right now we're still kind of stuck in your typical two-moment uh, portfolio mean variance optimization, expected return and, and standard deviation. We might have to add other moments in that portfolio construction, for example, our Shortina ratio, uh, and to consider a more optimal portfolio construction as we account uh, for alternatives. So I think that's a few things that might change in the future. Well, Penny Otis, I think that's a, a great tour de force on the hedge fund industry. It's been a lot of fun getting to know you a little bit better over the last few months and comparing notes. And uh, hopefully we can get you to one of our live events once once that becomes the norm. But but for now, we'll settle with uh, some fun Zoom conversations. Anthony, you have a final word? No, listen, I thought it was a brilliant exposition of uh, what is going on in the industry. And I think you made a very compelling case to have that solid diversified asset allocation plan. Uh, and what we're learning about markets, they're moving so fast, we're not going to have time to change our plan. And so I try to tell the retail investors, some of which are that are on this uh, Zoom call with us, you know, everybody has a long-term investment plan until they have short-term losses. And then once they have short-term losses, they start setting their hair on fire and running around in a circle. You made an amazing case for people just to stay disciplined and in the different buckets. Uh, and I really appreciate you doing that. And let's get you back uh, at one of our live events soon. Thank you again. Thank you. And I appreciate the invite and hopefully the first event might be Dubai. Never been. Um, there you go. Well, there you go. Right, we're going to get you out there. We, we did a great event in Abu Dhabi last year. So that's a deal. You're, you're on. Yeah. Well, thank you again for the invite. I appreciate being part of the, uh, the talk series.